<sighs> Your mic's on, Abe. Oh, okay, yeah. I'm, uh, I don't mind listening to you, Sad. Recording as well here. So, I, I think I finally got a recording where it works pretty well with OBS, other than the internet issues here, but... Let's see, I'll mute it. Hot dog, I gave up on my Chromebook. All right, everybody, uh, let's get this going. So I'm going to hit record here. Okay, starting. So I'm recording here for Tuesday, April 16. Uh, let's pull up the meeting agenda here. Tuesday, April 16. Okay, um, let me share my screen here too, and I'll start. So you guys can hear me. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Great. Great. So uh, uh, here we go. So just meeting, uh, what do you want to report? So I'm working on the, the production engineering for 3D printers, um, specifically a very high value <coughs> distributed production method. So concept being about 12 printers per day being built. And how do we do that in an extremely radically uh, efficient manner? So many people can pick up and also while we're developing pretty high end printers and, and getting the quality control up, up and going. So um, I'll talk a little bit about now the quiet. Uh, one thing I've been looking at is the quiet stepper drivers, um, which could be a great upgrade. And <clears throat> I'll go more into the 12 printer production engineering just to uh, cover where I'm at here. Uh, and right now I've got pretty good sound here, pretty good, good uh, internet. So we've got the fiber line here finally after years and years, after a decade or so. But yeah, that's all good. So I'll start with, um, well, I'm gonna go, go to my log uh, J and click on a few links. Uh, so I did look at, into detail about the, the, the new stepper driver little chips that are out there. Uh, and the, the reasons are a couple. So it's on a page called TMC2130 on the wiki. So you, we still got ramps or standard controller with this little pluggable stepper drivers. But the news here is, and, and I was trying to shake this down, there's a recent, I mean, relatively recent kind of a thing, which is from back from 2016 already, um, uh, a type of a little stepper driver that, that is one, completely silent, so, like, if you've ever run a 3D printer, they're they're noisy. They're quite a, quite noisy as the stepper motors go. And that one is silent. And the other thing about it is that you end up doing sensor loading uh, using the PNC 2130 stepper driver. So you can take a look at all of that. Now, in order to use the so, so, okay, can we do that? How simple is it actually to implement it? The advantage being get rid of your two end stops and not only two end stops, it, I was just reading about this, you can probably do the Z end stop as well, which is now the probe. So instead of um, using the probe and the end stops, basically the, when the motor moves, it detects a bump. Like if, if you bump into something, that means the current is gonna go slightly up in the stepper driver and that's detected and Marlin is actually set up for that already. 
the, the firmware is already can handle that. Um, so you can get rid of your probes, uh, the probe and two end stops. That's major, major stuff. That's great. Now, the only trouble with that is it's a little, at this point, it's a little complicated. There's a bunch of, not too complicated. I mean, you, you'd have to do a bunch of rewiring, as in connecting the new stepper drivers with pins that are facing up into some of these other pins on the ramps board. And there's also another issue about having to solder because this terminal here, if you see my cursor, um, that's currently taken up by the SD card reader and the LCD screen that we have right now. So you'd have to solder over the top of that. So just a few little inconveniences and including a bunch of rework of the code in terms of um, a bunch of settings that have to be reworked throughout in the code. So not absolutely transparent, but uh, quite doable. Now, there's better news, though. There's um, That's TMC2130. Now, just recently, like I think in the last year or so, it, the new one came out, which is called the TMC2208, which uh, after somewhat being disappointed by the TMC2130 in terms of a th thorough rework of the software, the firmware, and all this rewiring stuff, um, I read further and the TMC2208 actually allows you a complete drop-in replacement. So it's a newer one. Um, now the only thing is it will not allow you the sensorless homing. It will get you the complete silent operation. That's a good part. Um, as far as like if you want to, you know, right now I could be on this meeting running my printer next to me and it could just run in the background without making any noise. That's That's really good if you have say your home office filled with 3D printers that otherwise would be, I mean, kind of would have to have earmuffs, <laughs> earplugs, uh, or I mean, if, you don't, if you're not sensitive, that's fine. But I mean, they just make a lot of noise. So so one, the sign operation is awesome. So right now that it turns out without making any changes, the TMC 2208s, you don't have to rewire them in any way or change the firmware. They run as is to, to get you the super silent mode. Uh, another advantage being because it, it it actually gets to higher step micro stepping, like right now we run at 16 micro stepping. Um, it's still bumpy, but this the TMCs have 256 micro stepping. That means the motion is super smooth. It's absolutely smooth. So there's reports that the print quality actually goes up because you get less less kind of these inertial effects of the stepper motor going through its steps, uh, through its cogs, even though it looks like pretty smooth when you look at it and there's really like very tiny bumps in emotion as the stepper motor moves. So that's really good stuff. Uh, what I'll do right now here is then uh, I'll go to the uh, duplicate here. I'll go to the uh, 3D printer critical path. So what does that mean for what I like to do? Uh, I'll go to critical path. I'm, I'm calculating what are the absolute priorities in terms of, okay, the next steps of development. So as we do the release of the next and improved version of printer. So first of all, I've got the, uh, as I mentioned last week, doing 3D printed corners, so you don't have to weld the frame. Um, right now, I'm also t testing this. Um, it's actually a clone of the Titan Arrow, but it's got a hardened geared extruder, which is good so that the extruder gear never, like really never wears out. Like if you use abrasive filaments, it would wear out after some time. Uh, not, not a big deal, but something to look at. Um, another thing is that we're still not set up for, like, like the, the new printer gets complete 8 by 8 inch, and I just have to reset that a little bit in the, in the code. In the 12 inch uh, frame printer, we're able to get 12, the, for the 12 inch frame, which is convenient in that it's shippable in a UPS flat rate box, which are it's just 12 inches um the eight, but can get the full eight by eight using the current geometry of the 3d printer out of all inch frame so uh, just putting that into the code uh, i was going to clean up the wire box as i mentioned before uh, there's a little bit about optimizing how we print the stop folder so that you don't have to clean it up and i want to do this thing here the 0.8 millimeter nozzle production engineer. So typically we've been printing the parts at 0.4 millimeter nozzles, but the cool thing about 0.8, which is what I've 
last one I built with the volcano nozzle, um, that gets you four times the print speed because the print speed is going to be the square of the nozzle radius or square of the nozzle diameter. So going from 0.4 millimeter to 0.8 millimeter, you're actually quadrupling the speed of printing. So that's attractive if you print out a lot of kits. Um, yeah, there's a slight detail on the cable chain in that the first piece in the current version, which is a V1902, that is just a little misaligned, so I just, just one fix on the cable chain piece, a uh, small detail. Um, I also want to 3D print the control panel. So right now we're cutting out the control panel out of plexiglass. Well, no reason why we can't print it out. Perfect deal for 3D printing. So you, we get rid of one additional part, the, the control panel where you mount all the electronics, that might as well be 3D printed. Perfect. So you can print out all the holes. So you don't have to do all that drilling for mounting all the components. So that's a real time saver from the production engineering standpoint. Uh, 3D printed control panel out of PLA or ABS or whatever. Um, right now we're using cable, the little zip ties to attach all the components to it, like the power supply and everything else. Um, and then I gotta update the, the overall printer. Where's the TMP2208? That's actually right here. Uh, so the priority, replacement, no code changes. There might be one of the TMP2208 where we need to one with the wire. Uh, wire connecting stuff, or there might be a pin reverse needs to happen. That's a physical thing to do. Uh, very minor detail, otherwise, everything as is. Using right now, we're still backwards in Marlin, like we're on like Marlin 1.0 latest that the um, all the service homes that's at Marlin 1.9 and higher. So that's why uh, TMC 228 doesn't require the higher. Higher Marlin, can you use the thing Marlin? Uh, but eventually you want to switch over and just, just redo all the firmware. Big deal, updating uh, the code so you can take the full power, take advantage of the full power of the sensor, the swimming, quiet operation. Uh, complete control of the, the stepper current through software. It's no longer you have to turn that little knob on the stepper drives. You actually do that through the code, through the firmware. So that's uh, basically these new drivers are very configurable um, for completely quiet operation and sensorless and detecting when they hit something. And also a thing like when you uh, lose power, they can actually they have the capacity to return to proper printing because they can remember where they lost power. So it's a feature that's not in Marlin yet, but Prusa printers do have that in their system. Uh, Proof is kind of leading the way in their custom Marlin, their own firmware development, which is based on Marlin, but that hasn't migrated to Marlin yet. As far as like when you lose power, be able to completely restart print because uh, the software is set up for power loss uh, senses. So there's the eight inch, twelve, uh, eight inch bed, twelve inch frame, and as I was talking last week, um, in order to use hundred percent of the material from a cut out a metal sheet of 1 8 inch steel, which is currently what we use for the printer. Uh, the, the last smaller size is a 10, 10 inch frame, which can handle a six inch bed. And we can actually do the, the micro version, like a four or five inch bed using the innermost cutout, which is eight inches. So if we don't want to throw that out, we can still do about a four or five inch bed micro printer where there is, uh, that's not a crazy thing. There's uh, plenty of printers that are tiny, like the micro size printers, which have uh, four or five inch beds. So that still makes sense. And then you can do plenty of parts that are four inch. I mean, four inch is still sizable for uh, if you say want to print fittings or various other components. Uh, so that's kind of where it is on the, the roadmap. Um, let's see. So on the 12, 12 printer production engineering, just continuing on that and, and focusing on getting that, including the, the quiet drivers. So one major improvement is going to be that uh, the next iteration with the TMC 2208s is going to be completely silent. And after that, we can worry about the, the sensorless homing operation. That's going to be a little bit more of shakedown of the whole system. 
because you have to fine tune all the current settings and everything else. Like when you bump, how do you know that you bump? What, exactly what threshold do you set within the software for understanding that that's a bump, not just a regular motion within the printer? So, so there's fine tuning, a lot of fine tuning there. It's probably take a month or two of work. Um, but in the immediate sense, as we get ready for, uh, say, the summer school in July, uh, we just do the quiet 3D printer quiet stepper driver operation. So that's kind of where I'm at on my side. And yeah, maybe um, let's move on to other people. I think that's kind of some of the main points. Let's see if I look at um, if I look at my log. Um, did I cover everything I wanted to to do? Yeah. Now, just you know, one more comment on um, yeah the boot camp for twenty nineteen the the summer school. Uh, so as I said last time, focus will be so so really just mastering the three printing infrastructure, including the ability to make filament and doing a larger printer. So right now, if we go to Bootcamp 2019, the current proposed schedule is, uh, so that's uh, 2019 schedule. So we do the 3D printer build as normal. Day two, we'll just focus on making design files and free CADs so we can, everyone gets walks out being confident they can actually produce basic designs in free CAD. Uh, then we do the filament maker infrastructure on day three uh, and, and and if we have the filament maker, we can start making plastic, and we're ready to print very large things. So day four, looking at building the large 3D printer. So basically, one meter bed, where the z-axis, uh, there's four z-axis, and the xy gantry is moving on top of those four z-axis. And why that kind of strategy? That's different than what we have now. Right now, the xy gantry is fixed on top, and the bed moves up and down. Well, with a one meter bed, just the weight of that is like, I don't know, like uh, it's an eighth inch steel that's reinforced, but it ends up weighing quite a bit. It's, I think it's like 50 pounds or so, 50 or 60 pounds. That's without a print. Now, if you talk about doing big prints on that, they're going to add twice or three or four up to um, a full full print on a, on a meter bed. If you filled up the whole bed, like if you did like one solid cube, that's, I think, um, it's about 400 kilos. If, if uh, it, It's kind of adds up, but yeah, like a couple of people's weight, if you do a full 3D printer print on a one meter bed, it really gets heavy. So we want to fix the bed at the bottom and move the gantry up and down in this if we do a large 3D printer. So... That would definitely be the thing to do. Otherwise, we have to go to like either like super high gear down or much bigger stepper motors and things like that. So if we keep it a little more simple with more manageable parts, fix the bed at the bottom so you don't have to lift that heavy structure, just lift the gantry. Um, okay, so to wrap up the schedule on the, on the summer school here, so day five... Um, I think it would be a nice idea, and this is still kind of like shaking the schedule down here, but I think using the polycast with 3D printing filament where you can do lost lost plastic 3D printing, which you then fill with metal. Uh, so lost PL, lost, it's, I think it's a form of PLA. It's a lost plastic metal casting. I think that's that would be really good to get right into not only plastic parts, metal parts that are as precise as the 3D prints. And that's that's a very much accessible technology using a um, 3D printing filament that's dedicated for that kind of work, which burns out completely. So you, know, you just pour the metal in and the, plas and the plastic gets burnt out of your form, like out of plaster of Paris. So it's an accessible way to get, uh, for example, zinc aluminum, which is 60,000 PSI. Uh, no, not 60. It's uh, I think it's 49. 49,000 PSI, about 50,000 PSI. I mean, that's that's as strong as mild steel. So here we get access to very strong parts um, from 3D printing. And then uh, day six and seven was 
was going to focus on just just using all the techniques we learned and so from 3d printing and, and potential work with metal to i think to do a little bit of work on on the cordless drill or other projects i would like to build i mean if we have uh, a number of printers running at that time we have the option to build uh, other cnc machines like a cnc router even a heavy duty cnc machine if people are willing to do that i, I think i will open that to to the the crowd to see what what we want to do but i'd like to i would like to see some work done on a cordless drill which is a very exciting project that's really lends itself well to 3d printing including the possibility of metal parts and then some of the larger cnc machines based on the universal axis and we'll kind of have it as an open field day a couple of days where we were experimenting actually getting to a real something where, where all of us decide we're not going to just spread all into just a bunch of random products we'll decide to, to work on okay let's let's get this thing done in the next couple of days using all the prototyping capacity of like 10 or 20 3d printers so um, that'll be pretty good i think that's it for me for what i've got so far uh so let's move on to to others who wants to go next i'm here anyway I don't have to report, though. I've been working on a rugged mech. Okay, so since uh, people in the crew here haven't heard about it, can you can you briefly describe the concept and what you're trying to do? Okay, yeah, I'd love to actually. Um, yeah. This is making a plastic, or sorry, making a mold out of uh, a material called calcium aluminate cement and plaster of Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, you dissolve the plaster of Paris away, and then you have just the calcium aluminate cement. So it's going to be a highly precise mold because we can, we're actually milling the mold in layers. Like, uh, it's kind of hard to explain. But uh, I actually have a video. But Can you point us to a video or your own video or someone's doing this? Um, it's my own video. Um, this mm -hmm. has been, this is a process that's been in development since 1992, actually. Um, uh, there's different groups have called it shape deposition modeling. Some groups have called it Jackson Jackson sculpturing. Uh, but basically, you're doing you're putting an entire layer down at once as a sort of a thin rectangular block. Then you subject it to a milling operation. Um, and you do that repeatedly to build up layers of, uh, of calcium aluminate cement in this case, which are milled. So uh, it's highly accurate mold. And mm -hmm. so once you've got your you had the accurate mold, you can then fill that with, um, I was hoping to at first try thermal, uh, thermal set polyurethanes because they can copy the mold almost exactly. And if you fill them with carbon fiber, you can get materials as strong as aluminum. So it's pretty mm -hmm. good stuff. And they're not really expensive. They're like, uh, I checked, it was like $15 a kilogram or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. The idea is to make super precise molds that are milled from calcium aluminate cements, and then you pour metal or whatever yeah. the thing that you're going to set into that. Yeah, one of the strengths is that you can pour all kinds of stuff into that mold. Because you can use plastic, metal, a different. You're going to get different accuracies depending on the material. But you could use even rubber and foam, for instance. Mm -hmm. cool. So it works with aluminum. Yeah, it should work great with aluminum. Alum uh, calcium aluminate cements are uh, like plaster Paris, but they're capable of higher temperatures. Temperatures involved in steel casting. Can you go up to steel casting with calcium aluminum yeah. aluminate cements? Yeah, for sure. And I used for that purpose in a process called block casting. Where, uh, block casting? It's it's basically what you're talking about with the lost PLA. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You just take the wax model or the plastic model and you put it in like a Tupperware container. And then you fill the container with the uh, calcium aluminate cement, and then you burn out the plastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is that a stand? Like, so there's green sand as a way to to do casting. Uh, do people use calcium aluminate just like green sand, or is this like not popular? Because I never really, I, I hear a lot about green sand. Well, okay, so I've read up on the block molding process, and the main reason it's not used is that it's more expensive than green sand, because with the green mm -hmm. sand, you can recycle the sand. Yeah. Um, but the calcium aluminate cement is like, it's like, uh, just like Portland cement, it's really cheap stuff. It's like $10 for the 50-pound bag or something. So if you're making a ton of parts, maybe 
Yeah, it's not economical or something, but I don't think it's a major barrier. It is used by hobbyists. But, like, uh, I guess casting steel is not that common anyway. I think the bottom line is that most people don't really care about high accuracy with their casting because they're going to machine it anyway if, they're gonna, if they want accuracy. Mm -hmm. Is the idea here that you machine it beforehand to get super accuracy? Well, the mold is going to be highly accurate. That's So that's a great strength if you're going to follow up with thermoplastic uh, molding, for instance, which copies the mold very accurately. But if you're going to do steel casting, um, I think it's still a, a huge strength because I've read that premium uh, casting of steel can actually get pretty good accuracy, like uh, the range of 50 microns over, uh, I think it was 10 centimeters, which mm -hmm. is pretty good. It was 80 microns over 10 centimeters, um, which is still pretty good. And uh, with really good surface finishes too, like mate, nice surface finish. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But it depends. The accuracy you're going to get it is going to depend on that casting process. Yeah. So, for example, I'm looking at this castable. Is that what they call? Can you see my screen? Is that, yeah. for example, good? Um, good I can like see the screen. There's an enormous variety of different refractory materials. Um, most of them will actually degrade slightly at steel casting temperatures, and that's considered like just uh, run of the mill. Okay, so that's mm -hmm. calcium sulfate and Portland cement. That's not going to stand the temperatures of steel casting very effectively. It does work yeah. to some degree, but it, like you get a little bit of cracking and stuff, which is not good for the surface finish and yeah, it's not really perfect. Like, it's probably good if you don't care about accuracy all that much. Again, it's like, same deal. But, uh... Also yeah, it's like, man, where could I find it? Shopping. So what comes up with these tubs? That's a good question. I might have to... I, might have to... I don't know where exactly you buy it. It would have to be on... The best place yeah. to get it is uh, uh, AliExpress or Alibaba. Like those, that's direct business to business sites. So they'll sell the pure stuff. But it's always a problem for me. Like whenever I want something that's like pure stuff or like, you know, the good stuff, it's not going to be on Amazon or Google yeah. Shopping. And when, is that what we need? It says this one, for example, has 85% alumina. Is that, is alumina what we're looking for? Uh, Calcium aluminate cement is both calcium oxide and alumina in a crystalline structure where they, uh, they're they like, the molecules are intertwined. Like, uh, so, I don't know, like, they have all these non-men, these uh, terms, they kind of mix them up a lot when it comes to refractory materials. A lot of them are actually kind of interchangeable, but I would just get the pure calcium aluminate cement on AliExpress or Alibaba. AliExpress. Let's see, Let's see if that comes up. Yeah. Calcium Luminate Cement, Alibaba, AliExpress. I've looked Alibaba. for a bunch of those uh, aluminate type mixtures for refractory cement for things like rocket okay. stoves, and it is really confusing what exactly the chemistries are because uh, different types of bricks and those materials have, have different uh, chemistries and they vary apparently quite a bit uh, for temperature and uh, hardness and that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 No, if you go to hard to source the Ali small Ali quantities. Ali. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they do have it, in, and they have it like you know, like three hundred bucks a ton. Yeah. Exactly. So probably like that, and then you probably end up like five hundred bucks in shipping or something like that. Um. But still, if you you know if you're gonna actually get into it, that's very affordable. They'll send you a sample usually. If you want a smaller amount, you say, "Can you send me like ten kilograms as a sample?" Because I want to do some casting, see if it works for what I need. They'll still charge you, but yeah, yeah. For the workshop, yeah. did you try that? Did I? Try Have you it? tried it? Oh no, I haven't tried it yet. I haven't gotten that far. I've been doing the the process of producing the G code for the CNC code to run. Or CNC machine to run is that's as far as I'd be able to get because I don't have a workspace or anything. I'm working in Matt's garage right now, so it would, yeah, it's not practical to do yeah. much more. But are you yeah, documenting it? This, uh, are you uh, documenting what you're working on somewhere? Um, there is, yeah, there's a page, a Sensorica page. I don't know if you heard of Sensorica. Yeah, it's a, it's a little outfit in Montreal. Yeah, um, so if you if you go to the Sensorica projects site 
Um, it's kind of buried on the website. I don't want to say it's not a very good website. But they have a section for projects. And uh, on there, they have some documentation. I have my own section there. Oh, it's not calcium luminance. It's, uh, it would be under, uh, there it is. Yeah, that's it. I posted an update recently, like a week ago or something. Yeah. Yes, yeah, on the internet. So you call that mold. Yeah. Mold casting. Molding and casting. So yeah, that's my pet project. Uh, I feel strongly about it, but I really haven't been able to make much project progress. Uh, I've tried again and again to get a workspace. There's a place in Montreal that I applied to and went through their hoops and stuff. And then in the end, they said no. I had a workshop in Greeley for a while, but it was too small. Uh, and now I have a little workshop in that place. It's not going to last. Uh, I went with the garage, and they can work in there. But that's going to be a long time. Yeah, just post that on the wiki, mold casting. Um, oh, the thing that's really attractive for you, just to get it, is that, are you talking about the precision of the molds, is that you can get literally finished parts? Is that what you're after? Certainly finished plastic parts. Like with this thermoset mm -hmm. polyurethane, I think we can, we can get parts that are like store-bought injection molded parts. Like we're talking mirror polish, highly accurate, uh, yeah, because those molds that injection molded parts are made from are milled. They're made through yep. milling. So right. we're not going to do any use in that. Um, maybe even a little bit better. Because there's no strength and stuff. You need to pull the earth. Yep. It's just yeah. like when you need something to seal against a fluid, or you need gears that don't make any noise and last a long time, or you need all kinds of stuff like that. Like, you got to have accuracy and you got to have it smooth surfaces right like 3d printing is great for lots of stuff but it can't really get those last couple microns you know but typically in any kind of a casting process there's there's post finishing with machining right or grinding that's what i mean if you use the polyurethane um like like i say it's going to be like an injection molded part the injection molded parts aren't usually finished much as i don't think they're finished at all usually yeah, um, especially like a gear. I don't know how you get in there to finish anything. Yep. So yep. it's, it's going to be the same deal. It's going to be like uh, the good, accurate parts. That's for plastic. Now, when it comes to aluminum or steel, like you say, the conventional approach is to just to cast approximately what you want and then machine it to the final dimensions. And uh, I'm not sure how well we're going to be able to do there. But it's certainly true that if you search like premium injection molding, or premium investment casting. You can find some companies that are accurate enough that don't need post machine. They call it net shape casting. Sometimes there's a couple different terms. It's not very common, but it's a thing. Yeah. I can post about that on the Sensorica website. It'd be good to put some background stuff in there like that. Because I get a lot of this uh, is common, like uh, this. Some of them can be mastered. Steel is the worst. You got all these things, transitions. That changes the ball. But if you're molding a cast, um, you're saying that, I, I mean, are the casts reusable? The casting material is highly reusable, but the cast itself has to be destroyed so that you can get the part out of it. Right. It just, uh, it's going to be, we're just going to submerse it in one of those ultrasonic uh, baths. That they use for cleaning dishes and stuff, and just uh, subject it to also on to disintegrate the material. Right. That's the whole thing. But I mean, I think the, the hard sell for me is if you're going to be machining something in the first place already, yeah. I mean, you might as well be machining it out of the metal. Well, that's the thing. Okay, so in um, cases, unless you have cases where you can't machine it because it's not machinable because of a complex geometry, right? Yeah, that's one of the major reasons. Yeah, yeah. But also, I was uh, I was did have the privilege of being into CNC machining for a year there, a whole year, 
I repaired and worked on CNC machines and used them. Yeah. And it gets expensive very fast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's not, not yeah. cheap. Yeah, so like when you want to make a larger part especially, you're removing a lot of material and you're cutting it away with a blade. It's like solid steel. Yeah. And so this is going to avoid that. Yeah, you're just yeah. machining no, very fast. No, it's good. And I mean, the immediate hit at this is just using this the same material for, I mean, a lot of the similar processes, even without machining, if, even if you just want, you know, sub millimeter precision as in three, as in 3D printing, that's still very useful for casting in general. I mean, so yeah. yeah. I, mean, I hope techniques so. It's like a couple of things that really collide there. It's like, it's got like four or five different little properties that really make it useful, I think. Yeah. Useful. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's good. Okay. Um, are you aiming to do a prototype of that sometime? Like, yeah, you, I hope to do it accessible. I have money to for it. It's about five dollars and uh, actually do it. But it's a big problem to get a workplace. Um, I don't see it. I don't know when I'm going to be able to do it. Yep. In the meantime, we can continue working on the software a little bit. It's at the mm -hmm. point where we can write a plugin for Confusion, and then we can probably make the G code pretty easily. Yeah. 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 So that's an important milestone, too. But yeah. Yeah. That's pretty good. Um, Okay, and it actually makes me think of one one more thing about like if we go to like when we need to hire torque, and how do we ever do that? You know, in a resource limited scenario. So with stepper motors, I, I ran into this this uh, really cool thing where uh, let me just put up a link to that. So the idea is we actually make our own stepper motors. Right? Yeah, okay. So our own stepper motors. So here's how you get there. There's a... Have you seen that on the wiki? No. Okay. So... Did you print it at cordless? Uh, take a look at this. Um, this one guy, David Hardcop, uh, is doing the following. So I communicated with him on email. He responded immediately. But he did this. The split ring... Uh, it's one of these things I never heard of, and I couldn't believe it. Like, But this little stepper motor, it actually works. And inside the casing, it's it's called a split ring planetary gear. And he's got this little motor part in the back. It's all DIY here. But this thing here has like 500 steps per revolution. It's like, whoa, how do you do that? Well, the secret is this. It's called a split ring gear, and you have to. Uh, you can look on the wiki under 3D printed stepper motor, but the idea is that you have a a planetary gear where <clears throat> in two halves, one half is essentially like one tooth or a couple of teeth different than the other half, and what happens is when when you move the one part around one time the other part moves around only like one or two teeth. In other words, you get this huge, huge gear down from this kind of a system. So I was actually very impressed and I was looking at, uh, we should try to build this during the the summer camp or, you know, prototype because because it's absolutely spectacular in a sense. It's got the same form factor as an EMA 17. It's just got this simple electromagnet mechanism in the back and it gets this amazing gear down. So this to me is, um, is getting for practicality. And we can't even make our own step motor without the planetary thing. Like the one great parts of the that reasonably good torque without gears, and therefore no backlash. Well, except this is going to have like a hundred times more torque if you need it. Yeah. Uh, if the plastic could hold it. So the advantage is this is much more geared down. In other words, for the same amount of torque, think about they do make stepper motors that have like three, five, maybe ten planetary gear downs or other types of gear downs in them. Here you're talking like a hundred or two hundred. What this means is that a motor like this is sufficient for the precious plastic grinder. Now it will go, of course, very, very slowly, but the torque would be there. And yeah, the plastic wouldn't hold at that kind of torque. But if you enlarge the pieces, yes, it absolutely can. So this offers... Just amazing. Well, the point is, it's all 3D printed. It's it's the 3D printed gears and pretty simple electromagnet on the back. So the communication from his name is Dave Hardcop. 
Uh, he said that uh, this, the electromagnets overheat, so you got to insulate them uh, so they don't melt your plastic. But yeah, so there's definitely development work. But I just found this, uh, just the very concept of the split ring planetary gear. If you Google that, try to, uh, I've just been super fascinating that from this, this tiny, tiny form factor, you're actually getting this hundred or more type of a gear down. Because because uh, I think I mentioned something before about stacking planetary gears. Well, you can certainly do that with many more parts, but here you don't have to. So just a heads up on a very useful mechanism here. So anyway, um, I'll leave it at that. So I'll do the 3D printed. It's definitely worth trying because, you know, a stepper motor, it's like, yeah, of course you can make what you said, Anthony, a, a regular stepper motor, but that's, you know, that's a whole bunch of complexity there. That's yeah. kind of beyond the this, scope of... It's surprisingly simple. Though. I mean, you've seen the diagrams of them. It's just like the electromagnets, the poles, and the two, gear, two gears. Right? Yeah, I mean, conceptually, yes, but they do have these fine teeth on the magnet parts, the, the metal parts in there that allow for that very fine stepping. There is a very fine structure in there. So if you at that level, you're talking about, okay, you'd need to machine that precisely out of whatever metal, aluminum or whatever, steel. No, uh, whatever the structure there is. So yeah, there's basically it's this this route here. What I showed with a split ring planetary gear is just a total cheat. You don't have to go to that the same kind of complexity, completely different mechanism. Instead of using fine resolution, you're using the gear down for the resolution, but you in the same form factor. You wouldn't want to use that on your printer, though. For instance, like I think you have a lot of slop in the. Depends. It may not may not work for a 3D printer as far as that, but if you, it's just a matter of how accurate your 3D printed parts are. Because mm -hmm. if the the thing you'll be struggling with is backlash, no doubt, but backlash can be measured accurately and corrected for too. Uh, like for example, already in Marlin, you have so-called backlash correction on a stepper motor the, for, for the extruder, where because the plastic melts in the extruder, you have to push forward a little more before it actually starts extruding. And that's, it's like a backlash effect, but those kinds of effects can be corrected for pretty, pretty specifically in software too, so it could be a practical thing. Okay, so let's keep moving here. Um, let's keep going. Let's see, Abe, do you have, do you have an update? Yeah, I, I didn't uh, get too much CAD this uh, week. I'm busy with spring stuff and whatnot, but I have a few ideas. It's good to hear, but the, the printer stuff, I've I'm, I'm at least been building a, uh, a shelf, actually, just for to put a 3D printer on here because I don't have a lot of space for that kind of stuff. So uh, i kind of prioritized that this week and um, uh, uh, getting pretty close, to hopefully, to getting something finished on that. And then I'll be able to have at least some space for a printer. And I can start working more on um, figuring out what sort of uh, printer stuff to get. But um, <clears throat> and I'm kind of thinking about what kind of stuff that might be interesting to 3D print. Um, one thing is I was wondering at and seeing some examples of is uh, these containers for, for floating trees. They're small, you know, saplings to grow trees apparently on uh, water. Apparently that's popular because it on ponds and things that keeps them away from predators and kind of thinking about that. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen examples of the recycling some plastic and foam to float plants, trees out like that on ponds or tanks and things. And uh, I've experimented with that here, but uh, it'd be nice to be able to use PLA, but I you know the cost and, and so on. Uh, probably PLA printing a lot of material is probably pretty costly compared to other solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But looking forward to uh, okay. trying some of that stuff. See what uh, is reasonable. Yeah. Yep, yep. Okay. That's um, let's see. Um, how about Eric? Yeah. So just a small update. <clears throat> so um, I uh, had the uh, nozzle assembly piece printed um, at the public library and at the MSU library um, as kind of a comparison. Um, this was a follow-up kind of experiment um, 
for based upon the conversations I had with people at the expo. Um, seems like a lot of people are interested in printers, but they don't necessarily need to get their own up and running. So um, the public library is very cheap. Um, the university library gave a you know kind of a better print, um, but it was five times more expensive, ten dollars versus two dollars. So I'm going to send those results out to the people, and um, you know jump. It's pretty pretty easy if they actually want to get into it. Yeah, yeah. Any? Um, are you trying to see if there's people interested in a workshop of actually building printers or? Uh, so I'm going to send an email with, uh, you know, kind of different options uh, to get out, um, you know, from just uh, submitting jobs to the libraries um, to, like, you know, trying to build your own D3D and see um, if there's much of a response in um, people wanting to attend a workshop. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. So I want to kind of offer them information to start with before yeah. I try to <laughs> wrangle them into something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, anything else from anyone? Or so we can wrap up here a little early today. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll be continuing working on... Um, production engineering here on a 3D printer and get ready for the the summer summer program here where yeah we focus on getting that and getting to the large prints getting to our own filament making so, so yeah there's just a bunch of um, production that we can be doing and just getting them a change of shape to be able to go to the level of where you're making your own plastic and, and therefore that whole process is inexpensive, not to mention that we're getting into the closed loop material cycles using 3D printing and <clears throat> hopefully getting into some more of the metal metal work that results from 3D printing as in the casting processes. So for Can I ask a question about yeah. this? Um, it looks like there's like tons and tons of stuff to do there. It's like <laughs> only like a day for each. Like uh, it's going to, I guess, either take a ton of preparation or... Like, why not have a little bit longer or something? I don't know. seems like when people are there, stuff could get done. And you get the students, especially, who are willing to basically work for free. I don't see why not make it a little longer or something. There's got to be some way to do that, you know? We can do... Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that's possible. As far as the what's, what's on the agenda there, it would mean that pretty much get like for example the 3d printer you know make it really efficient and well prepared so yeah there's a lot of preparation that goes up front and also at the same time um you know what's what's interesting so that people people feel like one they're both learning and then also we, we can get some meaningful work done so so the one week you know, one week is easy i think two weeks could possibly work too um something like that and yeah, I mean, it could work. Consider I, I have to talk to William because we're we're going to do that together. So William from London International Academy, so he's going to do some of the work on uh, the parts with the Arduino elements and and possibly some of the motors that he's prototyped using 3D printing. So yeah, we can consider that. Is this is that for the thing in July? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think, yeah, yeah. Well, what, what we really need is like a university of doing or something. Like, if people actually did stuff in universities, that would really help. Yeah, like exactly. exactly. Um, I think that's that's the kind of stuff we want to get up, get ready for. I think um, uh, the way I'm looking at it, do a little bit this year, and because I'm still, you know, I'm working on a book. I'm getting this enterprise up up ground. So time is precious, but I think by next year, by we'll be doing full summer and then extend it to after we kind of master that, get it as a regular offering, get it into the regular, regular offering, it's more and uh, more full time things and more time around here. So much infrastructure and some steps for. 
that with the the core of the challenge or the set of challenge that working to the bed a build out for that and protect all kinds of things. but yeah it takes resources to get it. Um don't join when that is going on and you want to do that. Um including in the background how can it happen. But also I know other people who would definitely join. Yeah. It's like the window in your opportunity the window of opportunity comes in your life and sometimes it closes again, you know, and then you have a job or whatever. So right. I mean I hope we can do it soon. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, working on it. So yeah, yeah, that's um I think that's I have a that's it. Quick yep. question um about yeah. printing with uh, recycled uh plastic. So I was yeah. uh, poking around on YouTube doing some research and I saw um at least one version where they uh, print directly from plastic powder as opposed to trying to go through filament. Yeah. Um, are there considerations to doing that? Have you thought about that? Or yeah, I have thought about suggestions? that. And uh, at that point, you're talking about a completely different design of an extruder. Yeah. Now, the other challenge about that is you cannot get that as well controlled as standard filament. So you can do that, but I mean, you're gonna suffer an accuracy because you, you know, you're gonna have to put a lot of good effort into making that extruder reliable. Since first you're just melting and and it, you don't have that control as a, a well-defined three millimeter or one point seven five millimeter film, and that you know is there, and you know how hard you have to push it. It's gonna be much more, uh, um, much more finicky about it. Now there are printers that do that. Like I think the. Uh, I forget what, but but there are there are some that do that, and there was definitely one there at the Midwest RepRap Festival. They had a huge printer doing that, but it could do that because I mean its prints were not. I mean it was spitting out like a I think like a one centimeter um, filament, so huge huge prints. It was making these huge base bases, but it wasn't well controllable. Like for example, about retraction, if you have an extruder on top of a with a bunch of molten plastic, like your extraction, your retraction is going to be very limited. Uh, there's only so well you can control that. So yeah, it's a much harder proposition, but definitely yeah. doable. Uh, but just gets us in a completely different kind of technology scheme. Yeah. But it's, it's all doable. It's how much energy we have to, to go in each direction. But as far as like. Um, there's a reason why it's not so much more popular. I mean, people have tried it. There are some projects on yeah. RepRap that people have done small ones, but yeah, I mean, the results may be questionable at this time for how well it, it works. Yeah. Yeah, again, it worked in a step by step, seems like a good way to, yeah. to approach it right now. Yeah. 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 Well, that sounds good. Sounds good. So I think, uh, yeah, let's wrap up on this and. Let's see. Uh, thanks, Jen, for post agendas and the videos up on the Dev Team page. That's good. And like when I post, when I'm going to finish recording this, it, it's like I'm basically done with putting in all the info on the video, and that thing is already halfway uploaded. So I'll get this uploaded right after the, this, since we have fast internet line now. So it takes like a couple of minutes to upload. So you'll see that right after the the meeting. Okay. So. Thanks, everybody. And so we'll see you again uh, next Tuesday, April 23rd. Uh, continue going. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.